Welcome to the Peter King Podcast. We're at kind of the mid-season, so let's just call it a halfway point. Peter King Podcast for the 2023 National Football League season. I'm joined by my partner, Miles Simmons of NBC Sports. We've got a lot to get to in this podcast. We're going to get to the the Monday night game where, you know, I think that one time we once heard the great uh, Juju Smith-Schuster say, the Browns is the Browns. And... <laughs> And I didn't watch the game on Monday night. I'll tell you why. But, and that's why it's so good we have Miles Simmons here. But I woke up Tuesday morning and I said, well, the Jets is the Jets. And so, but, you know, again, I don't want to consign them to the dumpster of 2023 yet. But we'll talk about that game a little bit. And then I'm going to give you a couple of interesting things, I think, about uh, my trip to Germany, uh, my NBC Sports producer, videographer, Kristen Coleman, and I went to the Dolphins-Kansas City game in Frankfurt on Sunday. And a couple of interesting things from Sunday, and then on the international scene as a whole, then we're going to hear from our guest, Peter O'Reilly, the NFL's Executive Vice President for International uh, will join us on the podcast. I recorded him in Frankfurt on Saturday. Then we're going to come back in the back half of the pod and we're going to do a unique segment. And it's going to be five things Miles Simmons thinks about week nine. Basically because I didn't see any of it. <laughs> so we're going to get to all that, but... Miles, let's just start with the Monday night game. Chargers 27, Jets 6 at the Meadowlands. And look, I guess, you know, I saw only a few plays of this game. But when I woke up and saw the score, I just said, you know, Jets are probably fortunate without Aaron Rodgers at the midpoint to be 4-4. Four and four. And who knows? I think the game of their year is going to be Sunday in Las Vegas because they just absolutely categorically have to have that if they want to make any sort of playoff run. But give me your takeaway from what the Chargers did as both teams exit week nine with four and four records. Well, Peter, first of all, I'm I'm glad you made it back from Germany safely, as did Kristen. You know, this is we've got we are now here on this podcast to do it. But I, the the impression that I got overall in that Monday night game was that the Jets are not a good offense for multiple reasons, right? Zach Wilson, I don't think is a very good quarterback, but I also don't think that the Jets have anything going for their offensive line. And I think when you go to an even higher level, Nathaniel Hackett is not doing a good job of setting things up on a play to play down to down series to series basis. It's nothing really seems fluid. Nothing really is working. And the few times that something does work, well, Zach Wilson doesn't hit the receiver. I mean, the second play of the game, there's an out route to the right side and Zach Wilson just air mails it into basically into the stands. And then you're sitting there and you're like, man, this is the script. This is something that you've gone over plenty of times. You can't miss that throw that way. And Zach Wilson, yeah, he had two fumbles, you know, and there are, like I said, issues on the offensive line. But when we're in year three, you've got to protect the ball in the pocket. So to me, a lot of that game was about what the Jets did not do and what they could not do against a pass defense that came into week nine rated dead last in the league in yards allowed via the air, right? If that's the case and we can't get anything going as an offense against that kind of defense, then that says to me a lot more about the Jets and the myriad problems that they have offensively than it does about the Chargers. The Chargers did what they needed to do to win, just like they did against the Bears. I'm not really impressed with what I'm seeing right now from the Chargers from an offensive perspective. Defensively last night, yeah, they got it done, but when you consider everything that's wrong with the Jets' offense, it's like, okay, well, that's what you should be doing. You get a check, you don't get a gold star. So that that would be my sort of impressions on what we saw last night in that game. It's just wasn't very good. <laughs> the, the football was not that great. 
Miles, I walked into my apartment after a long travel day in Brooklyn on Monday night just after the long punt return for touchdown by the Chargers. And my first thought was, can't have any more of those. You can't have any more, you, you know, it, you, you can't fall behind my, by much. And then obviously pretty soon after that, Jets turn it over. Austin Eckler goes in on a short run. And once you get a 14 nothing lead on the Jets, I just, it's, unless you, unless you score defensive points and you're the Jets, you're not coming back on that. And, and look, Miles, a lot of debate, a lot of conjecture, a lot of speculation about Aaron Rodgers. You saw him on video uh, throwing the ball before the game. And you say to yourself, huh, interesting. Seven weeks now since surgery, uh, almost eight weeks. And you say, well, nobody, no football player ever has come back in a quicker time than five months and a couple of weeks, Cam Akers in, mm -hmm. as a running back. And quite honestly, it's probably harder for a running back to come back than a quarterback. Not, not a lot harder. I shouldn't say a lot harder, but it's harder because a running back, you, you need that flexion so much. You know, you need to be running all out. Quarterback, most of the time, you only need to be running all out if you're a pocket guy, which mostly Rodgers is if you're trying to get away from people, but still you can't risk that. You just, you can't risk it. And, and look, I'm not saying it's impossible that Aaron Rodgers couldn't play in January, but let's just say for the sake of argument that you're entering the last three weeks of the season and you know, the jets have some microscopic playoff chances. I mean, if I were Robert Sala, if I were Joe Douglas, I'd probably be the adults in the room and just say, we can't risk this. We just can't risk this. But again, let's see what happens. Rodgers has never made any big proclamations about when he thinks he's coming back and all that. And he did have the surgery that, and again, this is going to be hard for people who don't really understand, nor do I really, you know, how an Achilles tendon is repaired. But most of them are repaired in a singular fashion, with the Achilles being reattached in one place. But, you know, the way that Dr. Neil Elitrosh, uh, the surgeon, probably the best Achilles guy there is in the country, the way he did this surgery is basically, if you can envision an X, you know, a cross in which, or, or, or almost a figure eight in which, there are two attachments at the top and then two attachments down on the bone. And, and so I think for people maybe to understand that if the healing uh, continues at a rapid clip, you're talking about it being healed in four places rather than just two. And, and that to me is why a lot of surgeons believe that putting it, uh, having that kind of repair is better for a player, whether to get him ready quicker or even for the long term, because now you have it fusing in four spots instead of two. But be that as it may, it still would be a big surprise, I think, to see Aaron Rodgers play again this year. We'll see. He looks almost nimble, uh, you, you know, just less than two months after surgery. So we shall see. Miles, I want to get to a couple of things about uh, about my trip to Germany and my attendance at uh, Kansas City 21, Miami 14. You know, I, I, this is first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a you are there part of this. I interviewed Aaron Rodgers on the field for NBC's Football Night in America post game show Sunday night. And Patrick Mahomes, I believe you I mean. I am go going on. to exp Yeah, Pat yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes. Sorry about that. But so, you know, I know I'm gonna interview Mahomes. I had made this deal with both teams that, you know, if whoever the winning quarterback is, 
Uh, I was going to be able to get him post game. So obviously Kansas City wins. I get Mahomes. But let me lead up to it. And then I'll tell you something right out of it. And leading up to it, what happens when you are reporting on a football game, uh, you are not allowed on the field until the clock hits zero zero. So we're waiting in the corner of an end zone. And, and, and look, I got to get Mahomes, I'd say within 90 seconds after the game because he's going to do Stacey Dales of NFL Network and then he's going to do me and then he's gone. I think, I think that's, that's how it happened. Uh, so, and each one of these things are maybe 90 seconds to two and a half minutes. They're not long, obviously. So we cannot get on the field until zero zero, and there's this uh, very almost over officious uh, German security guy waiting in the corner of the end zone, and he holds his hand out, wait, 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 and we have these credentials that we have to hold up, and we have to barcode scan into uh, this little machine right at the corner of the end zone. There's two people in front of me, and then there's me, and there's Kristen Coleman, uh, who's going to be the videographer for this. So we, it gets to zero, zero, and the guy's holding up his hands. And I said, hey, hey, game's over. It's over. Game's over. And the guy just keeps holding his hand up. And I just said, look, dude, got a job to do. Let's go. So then he lets everybody go through after they scan their thing. So we kind of jog out to the middle of the field where the scrum is just ending, where, you know, obviously Mahomes is hugged to and, and probably said hello to a bunch of guys on the Dolphins. And as soon as I got toward the middle of the field, he was two steps away from Stacy Dales. And so he, he kind of, you know, just does the Stacey Dales. And I position myself to the left of that. And as soon as he's done with Stacey Dales, Ted Cruz, the uh, Cardinals VP of communications, takes Patrick. He brings him over to me and he, and he looks at me and he goes, man, what are you doing here? And I said, well, it, it's, a, it's a big game. And I didn't really expect there to be any... By play, I expected there to be, hey, Patrick, how you doing? Let's go. And because they don't take much time. So that kind of threw me off a little bit. I said, and he said, Peter, I, I didn't think he'd be over here. And I said, well, it's a big game. And so I looked at Kristen. I said, are you ready? Anyway, so the thing happens. And I'm going to play it for you right now. It's not long. Just listen. Here's my on-field interview at Deutsche Bank Park in Frankfurt after Kansas City beats Miami. With Patrick Mahomes. So Patrick, tell me what's going through your mind. It's 14 nothing. they're driving, and you make the huge play on defense to go up 21 nothing at the half. Yeah, no, our defense has been great all year. Trading turnovers, getting stops, and that's a, that's a heck of an offense. And for them to hold them to 14 points in the situation we put them in, uh, that, that's a legit defense over there. So. Of all the games you've played, you're held under 200 yards, but this has to be one of the most satisfying wins that you've had. Yeah, it was a big win. I mean, obviously it's going to mean a lot as we get to the playoff uh, pitcher. Um, but I think uh, just seeing the defense play like that and responding against a great team, we got a lot to clean up on offense. We know that. Uh, we'll continue to work. Um, but with a defense like that, we'll continue to win football games. Is this the best defense that you've had as a team? I, I think it's the best defense in the NFL. So, I mean, if, if we have a defense like that, we're going to get this offense figured out, I promise you. Uh, and then we're going to be a hard team to beat. You were frustrated at times with your offense today. Why? I think it's, we, we just we didn't make plays. At the end of the day, we didn't make plays. If that was me, if that was it was everybody. Something was off, and that's kind of been like that all year. Um, and I pretty much said, I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to have to find a way to make a play. Um, and then this season goes on, we're going to get, we're going to get make plays, and we're going to find a way to win. You're 1-0 in Germany. Yeah, I'm 1-0 right now. I don't know when I'm coming back, but I can say I'm undefeated out here. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So what was what's sort of interesting about that is that you know that there's a certain 
art to doing these on-field interviews post-game. And I don't really know what that is because I had never done one before, you know, which seems kind of weird. I've worked in TV for a long time, but I've never been a sideline reporter. I've never, that was the first time I had done a network on-field interview with a player after the game. And I've talked to some players, just talking to them, walking off the field at times, but that was the first one. And there's two things that you don't really understand until you do one. Number one, it's very loud. And you, <laughs> in my mind, I don't think I'm screaming. But when I, when I listen back to it, I say, man, you really didn't have to scream. These microphones are very, very good, by the way. And, you know, and all that. So that's a lesson. I mean, I'll probably never do one again. But anyway, that's a lesson I learned from that. And number two, you really have to listen to what the person said. This is a, the best advice about interviewing that I remember in recent years. I thought it was really smart. It was from Dan Patrick. You have to listen to what the person says, who, you, who you're talking to. And especially in a case like this, you've got maybe four questions, maybe five, but no more than that. Um, and so you have to make sure that when he says something, you got to be ready to go back at him. And I could just sense he was not early on in this interview when he basically said to me in so many words, he said, we got problems on offense and I can promise you that we're going to fix it. And he kind of kept coming back to that. And I just said, I just thought, I have to drill down on that a little bit. You weren't happy with your offense. Why? And, and so I think that is something else that I think even though there's mania around you and there's Neil Diamond doing Sweet Caroline at 98 decibels and all that. And, and the other thing is there's... 70 people swarming around you. They all want something from Patrick Mahomes the moment that he's finished with this. Now, he's probably not going to give him anything, but you can just tell that there's 70, 80, 100 sets of eyes on you uh, and all that. So it was just very interesting. The other thing that was interesting about it after we did this, Patrick... When I mean, Patrick is sort of like Tom Brady was a year ago when I talked to him. He, he thought, what an incredible experience this was. So he wanted to go and shake hands with a bunch of fans because those fans brought it at that mm -hmm. game. So he just went in the lower bowl and he just went around like, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 yards. And, you know, he just shook hands. He gave his wristband to somebody. It, it's just... It was a nice thing to do. And so afterwards, I went into Kansas City's locker room. I was going to talk to a few guys. And I see Mahomes. He's over there on his locker. This was not a luxurious locker room. This was a locker room, as somebody said, this is a locker room for a soccer team. Okay, uh -huh. you know, small guys, small lockers, not a lot of space in there. So, so Mahomes is over on his stool. Uh, he's just sitting there reading his phone. Blaine Gabbard is standing next to him, getting dressed. And Mahomes is just sitting there reading his phone. And I walked up to him and I said, hey. And he looked up and he goes, Peter, can't believe you came here. And so again, I said, well, it's a big game, you know. And I just, I gave him a little fist bump and I said, hey, thanks a lot for doing that on the field. It means a lot to NBC. Appreciate it. And he goes, yeah, no problem. And unprompted again for the second time he said to me he goes you know we're not playing too well he said but I promise you we're gonna fix it you, you know I can promise you second time he said basically the same thing mm -hmm. and it just sort of led me to believe and led me to think something about Patrick Mahomes okay and that is here they are seven and two and 
you know, either the best team in the AFC or Baltimore, Cincinnati, who knows? I don't know. So, uh, somewhere near the top. And he's just not happy. Hmm. You know, he's, he's polite, but you can tell he's not happy. And, but he's, he leaves no doubt in anyone's mind. <sighs> Come on, we're going to get this thing fixed. Now, will they? I don't know. You know, Rasheed Rice is a, va- is a vitally important piece of that puzzle. He's a rookie. Uh, I think Sky Moore, his progression, he really needs to ramp it up. He knows that. And I think all these guys really uh, understand the urgency. And I understood the urgency after I had to wait for 17 minutes for, for Andy Reid afterwards while Matt Nagy, the offensive coordinator, is behind a closed door in the coaching office with Andy Reid. So, so anyway, I say all that just to say, man, it's got to be comforting to have Patrick Mahomes in your corner as your guy when things are not going well, but he leaves no doubt. Don't worry. I know we only scored 23 points as an offense in the last eight quarters, and I know that there have been a lot of quarters, or last eight halves, excuse me. And I know there's been a lot of halves where we've scored 23 points. But the fact is, we are going to get this fixed. And I was just left thinking, that's really what you want your leader to be, to have that kind of attitude. Absolutely. Look, Patrick Mahomes is like one of those guys that gets it. You know, and, and you know, we can say that about different people. You yeah. brought up Tom Brady, and like that's kind of the ideal leader role that you think of, especially given what he did once he went to Tampa Bay, right? And he brought immediate cachet, panache, whatever you know, word you want to use to describe it. It, it Tom Brady brought something different to that organization. Patrick Mahomes has brought something different to Kansas City's organization, right? The floor with Mahomes has been losing in overtime of the AFC championship game at home. That's pretty incredible for somebody who came in as a pretty unheralded prospect, right? Yeah, Kansas City traded up to get him, and then he yeah. sat for his first year, and then we saw him in week 17 against Denver, and it's kind of like, oh, I guess this guy, you yeah, know, whatever. And then the next year he comes out like a house of fire, and the fire has never been put out. So I think what you're saying makes complete sense. When you have somebody who is going to instill the confidence in you because you've seen him do it, right? We have seen Patrick Mahomes play games on you know a very injured ankle right last postseason he was not healthy you know yeah. we saw him play with the toe injury in the 2020 season late there where he's going into the Super Bowl and he's still basically you know completely horizontal and hitting dudes in the face mask with the pass All right we understand what Patrick Mahomes can do as a quarterback and as a leader and so as the face of the NFL, which I feel very comfortable saying that he is the face of the NFL. When you see how he takes the care to go address fans in the manner that you just described, right? Where he's just showing his appreciation, where he understands his role in being on a national broadcast platform in doing a post game interview, right? When he understands his role as a leader of the offense and saying, I promise you, we are going to get this fixed. If I am anybody in Kansas City's locker room and Patrick Mahomes is saying that and I hear it, it's like, we're going to get it fixed because he believes we're going to get it fixed. And I can't let him down, so we're going to get it fixed. There, there is a sense of confidence that Kansas City ought to have going into the second half of their season after the bye. It just is, it's kind of a reassuring thing. And look, whether they get it fixed or whether they don't, the quarterback is infusing that belief in everyone in that building. So don't worry about it. And as I wrote, look, the difference this year, even if they don't get it fixed, and let's just say, let's just say that it's either Baltimore or Cincinnati and Kansas City for the champion, AFC championship. I don't know whether uh, Kansas, I, I don't, as of today, Kansas City's offense is not as good as either 
of those two offenses. Correct. Not by a lot, but by some. But right now, Kansas City's defense can play with either of those defenses. Baltimore's probably a little better, but it's it's it, they're all close. So that's the one thing that Mahomes has never had. An absolutely mm-hmm. rock solid defense that can hold a good team, you know, to 14 points, which they they did the other day. Miles, before we get into Peter O'Reilly, I I just want to ask you one question. I want to ask you what your sense is from NFL fandom, because right now there's 272 regular season games. Five of those games every year are exported, all five to Europe right now, but usually it's four in Europe and one in Mexico. I think, judged based on my conversation uh, with Peter O'Reilly and with others in the league, soon that number is going to rise. And at some point, I don't know when exactly it'll be, I think the NFL is going to play eight games a year uh, overseas or out of the country, I should say, because, uh, you know, obviously Mexico is not overseas. But I wonder, how do you think a fan feels about this? I get a lot of emails saying, keep the game in the U S and all that. And, you know, you don't see the premier league uh, playing real games in the U S they're all exhibitions and, you know, in their off season. And I get that, but I just think if you've been to one or more of those games overseas, you understand exactly why the NFL is doing it, but give me your view. What do you think fans think of this? Yeah, I, I think that you probably, if you are in Kansas City, would rather have the Chiefs play overseas or in Mexico, as the case may be, as an away team. Like, you don't really mind them going away, but you don't necessarily want to lose a home game. And I think you know, losing that home game to a premier team in the conference in the Miami Dolphins, you don't necessarily want to do that, but... You know, having been uh, to London to cover a couple of games um, when I was working for the Rams, I I also understand the international piece of it and how the fan base over there is so strong. And it's not just for one team or another team. And I thought, you know, Mark Donovan, the the president of uh, the Chiefs, made some really interesting points in your column about how this is not necessarily about what is right now, you know, in terms of a business strategy, it is for decades down the road where you are trying to establish a strong fan base so you can be more of a world team than just Kansas City's team. And I think that that makes a ton of sense. There is an appetite for NFL football in many, many, many countries, including our own, that needs to be satiated in some way. And if there is a way to make money off of it and kind of reward those fans for being such good fans. I understand why the NFL wants to do that. I think eight international games could be one of those sweet spot numbers that the NFL starts to target. And, you know, you get through that for a few years and let's see how it goes. But I do think that it makes sense to have these international games, especially now that you've got a 17 game schedule. So, you know, whether you're in one conference or the other year by year, you're going to have either nine home games or eight home games. And if you're giving up one of the nine, I think that that is a little bit more palatable than it otherwise would be. But yeah, I, I understand why the NFL wants to keep doing this and wants the game to grow in that way, because look at what happened last year in Munich. I mean, you were there for this, both of them, right. And this year in Frankfurt, it just, the fans' response over there is just overwhelming, and it creates a really, really, really special environment that I think is worth leaning further into. I think it is, too, and I understand the people who don't like it, but look, the way the NFL has it set up right now, every team, with the possible exception of the Jaguars, Uh, who played two games in London this year. I don't think they're going to do that next year. But with the possible exception of the Jaguars, I don't think an NFL team is ever going to have fewer than eight home games in a season. And that's Mm -hmm. what they've always had. So it's even though I'm sure Kansas City fans 
are ticked off, and I heard from some of them that the Tyreek Hill Bowl was 5,500 miles away. That yeah. bugged a lot of people, but yeah. I, I do think that in general, you're always going to have eight home games. I just don't think fans have a lot to complain about. But anyway, I talked about that. I talked about quite a few things in my conversation with the NFL's Executive Vice President for International Affairs, Peter O'Reilly. And here's my conversation from Frankfurt on Saturday with Peter O'Reilly. I remember coming here last year, coming to Munich, and I had a chance to tell Roger Goodell kind of what I thought afterwards. And I said, this is like a conference championship game in terms of the zeal for the game, the excitement for the game. I totally was surprised at how nuts people went for the game, and not just for the game itself, but for the surroundings. And, you know, in this, in this same square uh, in Germany, in Munich, where Adolf Hitler had made one of his most famous speeches, it's 90 years later, and here's every helmet in the NFL, and there are German school kids from all over the place here posing with, with these things and just saying, it is amazing, A, how the world has changed, but B, how the NFL has really gained a foothold in this country. I think that's right. You felt it last year. We all felt it last year in Munich. You knew that there was this history of American football in this country, going back to post-war, going through the NFL Europe days, which became concentrated in Germany. But you didn't really feel it until you were walking the streets of Munich last year and you saw from the, every generation out there and then being in Allianz Arena and seeing the passion, um, and not just passion, this was an educated fan base who was hanging on every play when they weren't singing John Denver. Um, <laughs> so, but it yeah. was, that was, that's what led us to now two games this year. And it's not just about the games, it's about a year round presence in Germany. The funny thing was after the game, I had to do a stand up for NBC and, and, we really had to wait for a while because the crowd didn't, they didn't leave. leave. They didn't want to leave. Even when they were said, they were told, okay, it's over now. I mean, they would have stayed another couple of hours. It was amazing. Yeah. It was, I'd never seen anything like it. And yeah. you've been around the NFL a long time. And I've been fortunate to be at the NFL 18 years. And that was a goosebump moment of people not, they just wanted to soak up every minute. Yeah. So you have this product now and it strikes me you have this product that is so in demand, and yet it's hard to get NFL owners to say, we want to put a franchise or franchises or a division over in Europe or however to do it internationally. Is the solution perhaps just more games, more inventory, now that you have a 274-game regular season mm -hmm. instead of a 256 or 272, mm -hmm. excuse me, instead of 256, is it more possible to play more games overseas than it was, say, three or four years ago? It is, it is, and that's where we got to where we are today was when we went to the 17-3 and three format, and I think what we've seen and teams have seen is the success that we can have in coming over here, the experience they have, the quality of the stadiums and the overall experience. So I would agree with your point that that's our focus, growing the number of international games, working with the clubs on that, and growing and expanding the number of places where we can play those games. Um, the fact that we're even having a conversation about potential expansion and teams is a testament to the fan base that we just talked about. But there are a lot of challenges that come along with that, competitively, logistically, talent-wise. So I think the first stage is what you described, continuing to build on the number of international games each year and the, number, the different number of markets that we play them in. So five games in 2023, three in London, two in Germany. In 2024, what do you envision the scenario being? We'll be back with two games at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which is a great partnership built for the NFL. 
the Jaguars will play again at Wembley next year um, as part of their arrangement at Wembley. So three in London. Um, we will be back here in Germany in Munich next year, having been these two games in Frankfurt. And then we're not playing in Mexico City next year at Estadio Azteca. That will still be in renovation mode prior to the 26 World Cup. So we are now evaluating between Brazil and Spain and are in the process of evaluating which of those markets would make most sense for a 2024 game. So that work is ongoing. Teams have gone down there looking at cities. Um, and I would expect we would make a decision somewhere in the December to early January time frame on that uh, fifth game. So when would you say there could be more than five international games? 2025, is that realistic to think? That is the earliest that would be, would be 2025. And those are, that's the work we're doing now, working with the international committee and really sharing um, and learning. But yes, that timeline of, of 2025 could be where you might go beyond um, the current, what's four games plus the Jaguars, which is an annual game for them. I'll give you my Christopher Mad Dog Russo question <laughs> that I don't agree with, by the way, and that we've had a couple of debates about. But why is there so much hunger, so much thirst by the NFL to develop international games? Why not just keep all 272 in the United States where in the opinion of some, maybe many, they belong. And you look at it, a league like the Premier League in soccer, even though they're very popular all over the world, they're keeping all of their games, you know, back home, you know, in their home country. Why do you believe that international is so important? I see it in walking the streets of Germany in all of these places we go. There is a thirst for this game, and there is a fan base that is hungry to experience the game. And it is one thing to watch it at odd hours when, as dedicated fans, they do and watch all of these games or uh, consume it on social media. But to bring our best product live, and obviously there's a history of American Bowls and a history of NFL Europe, but to bring our best product live, and our schedule allows us to do that, given our once a week schedule, to bring that product is, um, it is such a powerful opportunity and we do it judiciously. You know, we're talking about five games uh, as the numerator on a pretty big denominator and maybe, yeah. that, maybe that grows, but we have aspirations because we wanna serve our fans around the world to be a truly global sport. And we talk to the Premier League all the time. We learn from each other. Um, they obviously have friendlies that they play out of their uh, regular season schedule, but they're always exploring how do we get to new markets? How do we do more things? It's a little more complicated in some of those other sports based on their schedule. So um, I don't think one should be naive that other leagues don't have similar aspirations. We might have slightly different approaches um, but this is a sport that, that has the potential to be a truly global sport, um, and we'll continue to explore that while being very conscious of this is a game that was built in America in cities uh, and in towns who will, uh, you know, who love the sport and, and want access to it every week. What have you, what would be your sense, your gut feeling? on whether a Premier League team would ever play in the United States? Huh, that would be, uh, I don't uh, think about that one that much, but I would say that would be a, that would be a big move for them, um, given the history and the ties <coughs> to, you know, towns and cities in the, in the UK. Um, but we, you know, they are they are active, and, and certainly as we go into, I don't think that's imminent at all, but as you go into a World Cup in the United States, the Premier League and other leagues, like our partners here in Germany, the Bundesliga, they want to grow their presence, their club's presence in the U.S. So um, a franchise, who knows? Um, gaining a foothold in the U.S. and other parts of the world is a huge priority, and it is for us as well. Seems like they already have it. When those friendlies are played... It's like when the NFL used to play exhibition games overseas, 
people were excited, but I can't imagine if Liverpool ever had a real game in Philadelphia or whatever, Cincinnati or something, how crazy people would go. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I don't know, maybe six, eight, ten years ago, I thought that there was a lot of momentum to put a team or teams in Europe. And now where it looks like nobody, re no owner is really very interested in selling right now, that and every franchise in the league seems fairly solid where they are. I wonder, do you ever see a day when there is either a division or a couple of teams in Europe? I wouldn't rule that out. I think that is within the realm of the poss possibility. The commissioner has referenced that. But to your point, I don't think it's imminent. I think that in a good way, to your point, there's great stability right now across the 32. Um, they're in great markets and there's strong stability overall. So I don't think it's imminent. Um, and I think the focus is what we talked about previously, building up that inventory of international games going to new markets we have teams as you now as you know who have marketing rights in these in these countries now the chiefs very active this week and year round the patriots very active in year round in germany so it allows a club to have their home in the us while also building their brand and their fan base around the world so but just having this conversation around a potential division or teams is a testament to all the progress that's been made and what's come before us, that there is a fan base. Because no question, if you had a team here, would it be successful from a fan standpoint, sell out and commercially? I say yes. There are other factors, though, that go into that when you think about the structure of the league and travel, logistics, yeah. and competition. Those things are big and formidable. I want to ask you about how the games are scheduled here because it seems pretty logical to think that Carolina will be the home team of, for a game next year because they are one of the four uh, teams that have shown the most interest as, uh, you know, in Germany um, as a home market or a potential home market. And I wonder... How much has that sort of changed the landscape of teams' willingness to play overseas? Quite a bit, quite a bit. You go back to the early days of 2007, that first... The arm-twisting days. Yes, those days. I mean, that was, that was Giants-Dolphins, and Dolphins gave up a home game for that first game over there. The Giants happened to win the Super Bowl this year, that year, which was a helpful narrative. Yeah. Um, but now it is very much teams raising their hands. There's a reason that the Chiefs and the Patriots are the two designated teams these next two weeks, and that's based on they have rights here. They raised their hands and said, we want to be over there in Germany. To your point, Carolina, we actually now have the Falcons, who are a fifth uh, team with German rights. Um, you know, They will want to play here. To your point, Carolina will want to play here as a designated team. Um, Has that been determined with finality yet? Not, fi not with finality. Yeah. Not with finality. That's in the hands of the the, the scheduling process that will mm -hmm. is still to come. Um, but as even as we think about new markets, um, some of those we just talked about, like a Spain or a Brazil, um, there are clubs with rights there. There are clubs who are intrigued by being that first club, that first mover to go into a new market. So who were the te refresh me who are the teams in Spain and who are the teams in Brazil right now it's a relatively small number the yeah. Bears Chicago Bears and the Miami Dolphins both have rights in Spain and the Miami Dolphins have rights in Brazil um, but that's not to say there wouldn't be new teams as that right. process refreshes each year knowing that the league is being proactive in those markets we may want to follow along and get those rights how are the stadiums in both of those countries they're strong. There are, um, obviously in Brazil, uh, though a little um, while ago, you've got a World Cup and Olympics yeah. in those, you know, in, in stadiums used in Rio and Sao Paulo that are, are good and the history of big events down there. So we're in that diligence process now. When you think about um, Spain, you've got obviously great um, 
soccer clubs in in those uh, you know in cities in Spain that uh, and, and a strong fan base there. So infrastructure wise is good. Um, so ultimately depends on inventory. I would envision us um, playing in both of those markets at some point. We have to choose one for 2024. I wanted to ask you something about the fervor of the soccer clubs everywhere. When the NFL comes in, there's great excitement in the country. But I would think that some of the soccer clubs, like even though Bayern Munich last year was a great host, and and obviously they have to love the attention and all that, is there some part of them that says, well, NFL, we love you, but don't get too successful. Soccer's our game. Um, I, our partners at the DFL, the, the, the German Football League and the and Bundesliga, we have this conversation a lot, and we have a memorandum of understanding with them. Um, they see the big picture here because not only, obviously, great host to your point, and, they, and Eintracht Frankfurt will be a great host this week as, as Bayern was last year, they also see – that there is, there are things that we can learn from them and they can learn from us. So whether that's on media or content or even things that, I mean, we came over here and did a presentation on next gen stats and what we're doing with chips and how could they use that. Um, and like, you we, mean in soccer, in soccer. So yeah, I mean, those wow. type of conversations and, and uh, kind of thought sharing, if you will, is, is there. And then like we have, desires to grow in Germany and outside the US, they have desires to grow in the US. And we're a prominent, culturally relevant presence in the US. So I think you step back and see the big picture. And like in the US, people can walk and chew gum. You can have multiple sports that you consume and love and kind of growing sport passion is not a bad thing. So, you know, you, you always have a little bit of that competitive dynamic, but overall it's you know, they've seen the big picture, and we do too. We'll end with this. What have you learned in your time uh, working internationally? What have you learned about the NFL's relevance outside the United States? It is much greater than your average fan in the U.S. might assume who has not traveled to one of these games or been over here. The knowledge of the fans, the resourcefulness of the fans because like I said before it is though we've got great media partners you have to be really committed to stay up to watch a you know a four o'clock eastern game is a pretty late end and certainly a Sunday or Monday night game but the the knowledge the avidity of our fans is so strong and the thirst for more of it and then even decisions and the amount of texts and emails I got when the Olympic decision was made that flag football is now in the LA 28 games that just triggered for me um, not just the passion for the NFL but the love for our game and the fact that now you've got young girls and boys around the world who could be playing the sport that they love on Olympic stage for a medal um, that just starts to open an aperture that didn't exist before. So those type of things remind me and us of the opportunity we have. Peter O'Reilly, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate you having me. My thanks to Peter O'Reilly. And as I say, look, I think probably long after I'm gone, but I think the NFL will be playing eight games overseas, probably will not put franchises there. Uh, not out of the question, but probably not. And I don't know what year it'll be, but you heard it here first. Eagles versus Rams in Australia. Sometime, I don't know when, what, 27, 28, whatever. I would think that the Eagles would still want to have Jordan Maylotta playing for them. You know, the, uh, you know, it was from that part of the world. Uh, their great young left tackle. But anyway, we're going to break right now. And when we come back, we are going to highlight five things Miles Simmons thinks about week nine in the National Football League. And 
now we come to the Miles Simmons part of the program. Just so that you can sort of understand my ignorance about week nine in the NFL. Uh, I stayed in a hotel in Frankfurt and on my hotel television, there was one early game. I got back to my room to see the last few minutes of uh, Baltimore myrtleizing Seattle. And I just figured, okay, because I looked on the guide, there was going to be a game at, uh, you know, in the late window, which in Germany is 10.25 p.m. So I kept the TV on and hear all these strange voices talking and a little bit of a pregame show in German, obviously. And the next thing I know, they're taking us to Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas for the Giants and the Raiders. And I just said to myself, does somebody here not know what's going on in the NFL? Does somebody <laughs> here understand that that Dallas and Philadelphia are playing simultaneously? And are you kidding me? Giving me this game between two teams that are having awful years? You've got to be crazy. But anyway, that was the game on. You don't get highlights from the other games. For the next three hours, all it is, Giants, Raiders. And didn't look really good. And <laughs> as I saw Daniel Jones really tear, tear his ACL in the game, when I looked yeah. up at one point, I'm writing, but I look up and there's Daniel Jones evidently tearing his ACL. And I can't hear a damn thing. I, I can hear it, but I have no idea what these guys are saying. Plus, they're sitting in a studio probably three miles from where I am in Frankfurt and they, they don't they don't know what happened. Nobody knows what happened. But anyway, I had a pretty bad feeling when I saw that. But anyway, Miles, I want to go through. I've given you a big assignment this week. Give me the five things that you think after Sunday that I really need to need to know. All right. Well, let's start with one of the games that you just mentioned that you didn't see, which is Dallas and Philadelphia. And I think that Dallas needs to actually win a big game before we consider them true contenders. And look, they were close yeah. against Philadelphia. You know, they were. And, and Dallas has had good moments, but at the same time, they have not pushed themselves over that final barrier, especially when they're on the road. And so I, right. I wasn't unimpressed with what I was seeing out of Dak Prescott and with what I was seeing out of Dallas's defense, but at the same time, when you have the opportunities to close, and especially at the end of that game where Philadelphia just was peeing down their leg, which is not something I expect to see out of that <laughs> team. It's not really something that they've done under Nick Sirianni. I mean, they just haven't really done that. And they give Dallas the opportunities down there, and then you get the penalty, and then you get all these other things that are happening at the end of the game, and Dallas just doesn't get it done. And so... If you have those opportunities, the great teams, they take 56 of yards of penalties right. on that last series, 56 yards of penalties in 33 seconds. I mean, that was exactly. unbelievable. Anyway, it was unbelievable. So yeah, that's the one. That's the first thing yeah. that I would say is that Dallas just is not quite there yet. And maybe they get there, but for right now, they're not there, Peter. Yeah. And you know, look, obviously I didn't see it. Now I did <clears throat> make it a point. Um, I watched a few things on YouTube uh, on my layover in Amsterdam on the way home from Frankfurt. And I was able to see, I think every play of that last series um, that, Dallas, that Dallas had on offense. And I just said to myself, look, great game for Dak Prescott you know, overall really was, but they were handed 56 yards on that drive, handed 56 yards. At some point, and I'm not putting it all on deck, at some point, you got to make a play and you got to take advantage of that. Over and over and over and over again, the Dallas Cowboys do not make big plays late in games. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, in the immortal words of Bill Parcells, you are what you consistently show. And mm -hmm. that's who the Cowboys are. Maybe they can change it. But that's who they are right now. You know, so 
I don't know, Miles, give me, give me number two. Number two on the list of the five things that Miles Sanders, Miles Sanders, <laughs> that, <laughs> Miles Sanders that Miles Simmons <laughs> needs to teach Peter King about this, about this weekend. Well, Miles Sanders could have made the list uh, along with Bryce Young, but he did not. Um, uh, and that horrible Carolina Panthers loss that they had to the Indianapolis Colts. But I would say that Baltimore right now is playing the best football in the National Football League right now. And I think that they are the league's best team right now. Now, does that mean that they are going to be the best team when we get to January? No, I, I, I don't know if they will or they won't, in part because I don't know if Lamar Jackson is going to be healthy. And it's kind of like I hate to be that guy. And I don't need yeah. to question Lamar Jackson's will or want to because that's not what this is. But when you have only played 12 games in each of the last two seasons, and when we get to December and January, you haven't been available yet. The first thing he's got to do is be available. But you know, Patrick Mahomes, and I say this with all due respect to Patrick Mahomes too, said that the Chiefs defense is the best in the NFL. I think right now the Ravens defense is the best defense in the NFL. And part of the reason why I think that is because Baltimore has the league's best point differential, right? They have had Detroit, one of the true contenders of the NFC, come in there, beat to the, beat them to hell, right? They had um, the, the Seattle Seahawks come in there on Sunday and beat them down too. You know, they have won these two games by a combined score of 75 to nine. And these are really true contenders in the NFC. So that's right now why I think that Baltimore is playing some of the best football in the NFL. And when you get a guy in Keaton Mitchell, who most people have never heard of, and he has nine carries for 138 yards and an offense that was supposed to be more of a passing offense this year, that tells you where Baltimore is. And they are at the top of the AFC North for a reason. You know, the one interesting thing about the Ravens that I think what I think right now is that everybody wants to talk about Lamar. Wonderful. And he's been, he has been everything that they need him to be. But I kind of look at this team now and I look at it a little bit of the same way I look at Kansas City. Look at that defense. Look right. at the depth that they have. Look at the guys who you didn't necessarily expect. Look at Geno Stone. It's a top yeah. 10 safety in the NFL this year. Uh, I mean, look at Roquan Smith. He has to be in at least the conversation. I wouldn't give him the award, but he has been a huge player and he should contend for defensive player of the year. Uh, and, and so I think... They are showing everyone the trade for Smith at the trade deadline in 2022 was a great move for the Ravens, and it gave them that guy in the middle of their defense that they really have lacked since Ray Lewis left uh, because this is a guy who can control the game. And just like Bobby Wagner, just like a really great roving uh, middle linebacker, inside linebacker, he makes plays from sideline to sideline. I really like Baltimore. So I think, hey, Miles, five days starting Sunday. They play Cleveland at home uh, on Sunday. And then mm -hmm. they play uh, Cincinnati at home the following Thursday. And look, it's great. They got them both at home, obviously. And they're 2-0 and against those teams so far this year. Uh, but that is a gigantic five-game stretch. We're going to find out a lot about the AFC North um, by a week from Thursday uh, when, to my way of thinking, that is the best Thursday night game of this season, uh, Cincinnati at Baltimore. Miles, number yeah. three on your list of five things that you must teach Peter King about this weekend in football. Well, I'm glad you brought up Cincinnati because I think Cincinnati is back and I think that they are going to be a huge problem for the rest of the AFC. And I know that, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals have had the Buffalo Bills number over the last year, year plus, if we want to say that. But this is what the Bengals do. 
they kind of find themselves through the first few weeks of the season. And this year it had to be Joe Burrow's calf, you know, that kept them out for almost all of training camp last year. He was dealing with the appendix issue and they kind of start off a little bit slowly, but once they find themselves and once they start clicking, they don't stop. Right. This is just who they are. It is what they do. And when Joe Burrow is playing at the level that he's playing at and he's got guys like T Higgins who can step up and do the things that he needs to do when the Buffalo Bills try to take away Jamar Chase a little bit. What does T Higgins do? Well, he has the best game of the season. First time he's gone over 100 yards. That Bengals defense, I think, is a little bit underrated, too. When you have Trey Hendrickson playing like he's playing at defensive end really has been one of the more underrated players. I think this year as an edge rusher, he is helping power that defensive unit. They're doing a great job there with Lou Anarumo as usual. But now that that offense is clicking, everybody else better watch out. And I say this also with all due respect to Baltimore, that Cincinnati Bengals team is going to be either at the top of the AFC North or just narrowly miss out on another division title because that's how good that team is when Joe Burrow is at the top of his game. And what they did to the Buffalo Bills, and the Bills have their own problems, I understand. But when you come in there and you've got to play the Cincinnati Bengals, you've got to be at the top of your game right now because they are and they are going to be a factor in the AFC this year. What's so interesting, I think, about the Bengals is that, to me, we knew they had a good defense, good to very good defense, but I think it just shows with an exclamation point. If you want to look at three teams this year where you say, wow, this really shows how important the quarterback is, I'd look at the Jets in sort of a negative way. They're sitting there four and four, but the arrow's pointing down. The Bengals sitting there at five and three, arrow pointing up, and maybe nobody would think of this, but I would. Um, I think of the Houston Texans. How possibly could they be four and four right now? Uh, They're four and four because they drafted what looks to be a great quarterback, and it looks like, and we'll see, you can't say this with finality, but it looks like they might have picked uh, the best quarterback in this draft in C.J. Stroud. All right, Miles, number five, what do you got? Fifth Boy, thing just, that Peter King needs to know about this NFL weekend. You just took one of the things that was potentially on my list with C.J. Stroud, perhaps being the best <laughs> quarterback of this 2023 draft class. Because, I mean, if that's a game that I would say you need to go back and watch the whole thing with Stroud because it was one of those things where the progression went from, yeah, in the first quarter and the second quarter, you're like, I see some things with Stroud where it's like, all right, he's starting to get going. But that third quarter, man, he was brilliant. He was on point with seemingly every single throw. And then also into the fourth quarter, reminding me of the college football playoff game that Ohio state played against Georgia, where every time CJ Stroud got the ball in a critical situation, you're just like, Hey, he's going to go do it. And that's just his attitude. And that's the way it was. But I won't use that for my last thing, I think. Instead, I will go to Cleveland, where I think that the Arizona Cardinals put Clayton Toon out there as a sacrificial lamb for whatever it is that they needed to do to figure out their quarterback position for this week when they are going to play the Atlanta Falcons at home. And Kyler Murray is perhaps going to be activated if all goes well, as Jonathan Gannon said on Monday. Clayton Toon had absolutely no chance, none, zilch, zero against the Cleveland Browns defense. It was sad (laughs) to watch. It was, I mean, I, it was one of those deals where it's just like, why did you do this to him? You send him out there unprepared. I mean, they had 56 (laughs) yards, 50, Peter, 56 total yards. I, I, I saw a stat that was Cardinals had not had that few yards since the 50s. Okay, you're setting defenses, excuse me, offenses back that long. Are you kidding me? Oh, 70 years. It's crazy. So it's seven first downs, one to 12 on third down, 56 total yards, 56 total yards, man. I mean, I think that the Cardinals understood how tough the Browns defense was going to be. And if I'm them and Kyler Murray's coming back off of a knee injury, I might not want to put Kyler Murray against that defensive front either. 
But man, oh man, I, I hope the universe blesses you, Clayton Tune, because you were just thrown out there as a sacrificial lamb, and I, you don't often see that in the NFL. Yeah, that was that was a shame, and and at least for him to have your first start at Cleveland, Miles. I, I would just make this point. I still am having a hard time figuring out why you. Let's say even you're gonna you're gonna play uh, Clayton Tune for a week or two or whatever you're gonna do. Why would you trade Josh Dobbs when I mean, and again. I'm not saying they traded Dobbs to give them not a good insurance policy at quarterback because they want to lose all these games, even when Kyler Murray comes back. But just doesn't make a lot of sense to trade him. I don't know. Just I understand they don't view him as their long-term future at quarterback. But, I mean, don't you have some games that you'd like to be competitive in this year? I, I just didn't get that at all. Miles... We're going to cap this podcast. We're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what, in my opinion, is the game of the week in the NFL. And probably at the beginning of the year, you would have never thought this. But Jacksonville hosting the San Francisco 49ers coming off a bye. Um, and obviously, both teams are going to be uh, rested. And I think, incredibly... This game's really more important for San Francisco than it is for Jacksonville. Don't yes. we look at the AFC South now and think that, barring a major surprise, Jacksonville probably is going to win it? I still think San Francisco is going to win the NFC West, but I don't think it's going to be quite that easy. So the one thing when I look at this game, I say I bet that right away, Chase Young's going to get 40 snaps for the 49ers. And they're going to try to do a bookend with Chase Young and his old friend from Ohio State, uh, Nick Bosa, coming at Trevor Lawrence. I think that is going to be a tough thing for Jacksonville to defend. And on the other side, Brock Purdy's got to play well. And I made a joke in my column about, you know, somebody, whoever, saying... Are you going to bench? Uh, what was the question? Are you going to make a change at quarterback? And if not, why? And Kyle Shanahan said, well, we don't often make uh, decisions or make changes for no reason. <laughs> and so I, I, like, I like Shanahan's response to that. But what do you think of this one? Miles, give me your view of how this one unfolds in Jacksonville in the early window on Sunday. I think the 49ers know that they need to right the ship right now, and they're going to play with a sense of urgency. I, I think it's interesting that they went out and they got uh, um, Chase Young, you know, because it is sort of their signal that they're doubling down on what it is that they do well, right? They already got Hargrave, and, you know, he's not necessarily been as productive maybe as people might have thought in that defense, but I think – one of the positions of weakness, if you want to say that, was the edge rusher opposite Nick Bosa. And so now you bring in Chase Young, and ostensibly you've solved that problem. Now, Chase Young still got to play to that level that he was at as a rookie. He's been playing toward that level for Washington this season um, after you know he got hurt in that second year. And last year he barely played because he was coming back from that injury. So we'll see if he can get to that level. But I think... Being with the 49ers, being on a team where you're not necessarily depending on him to be the absolute best guy because you've got all these different pieces around him. And also, the 49ers should get at least Debo Samuel back, if not also Trent Williams. And they haven't won since they lost both yeah. of those two guys against Cleveland. I think that's going to be huge because I always say that having Trent Williams on your team as your left tackle is almost like having an elite skill player because of how good he is at that position. So all of those things I think can combine to San Francisco riding the ship. But I also am interested in seeing how Brock Purdy can respond. And also like Jacksonville gets paid too, right? This is a good team that they're going against. So if Jacksonville can do what they need to do to win and win an important game at home, then this could launch Jacksonville potentially into that spot 
that you predicted that they would be in, Peter, in part because of their schedule, right? That number one seed in the AFC is still something that's open to them. I guess I would leave you with this, Miles. A couple of weeks ago, we all thought that the worst Monday night game of the year was going to be um, Denver at Buffalo here in week 10. Now, we look at a Denver defense that has woken up, uh, that's allowed 26 points and beaten Green Bay and thrashed Kansas City. So Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I'm kind of fascinated by the Denver Broncos. I want to know what we're going to see Monday night. And look, if you're Buffalo, you take any win. There's no style points this week. You must win this game, period. And when I look at this game, especially because of what Buffalo has coming after this, they've got, you know, a death march, really. But I I think I look at this and what I want to see out of Buffalo, get things right. Start to understand that, you know, your job on offense is to control games, not leave it up to the defense all the time. So in in an odd way, you know, there probably isn't a better, a bigger team. I'd say San Francisco, number one, teams that have something to prove this weekend. But it's Buffalo, number two. Because to me, when I look at this team, or when I look at, at, at these games this weekend, it's a bunch of lousy games. But there are some big games for teams that have something to prove. And Miles Simmons, we're going to be taking a look at those games. Maybe not a lot of others this weekend, But we're going to be taking a look at those games and we'll have some dissection next week on the pod uh, when we get back to you. And maybe when my voice is a little better after a few days in Germany. But anyway, we appreciate everybody experiencing the pod, watching us, uh, watching the podcast, uh, either on Peacock or the NBC Sports YouTube uh, page, channel, whatever we call it and listening to it wherever you get your podcast. So thanks a lot for experiencing the Peter King podcast. Me and my partner, Miles Simmons, my partner, Miles Simmons, and I rather appreciate that. And we'll be back next week with another episode of the Peter King podcast. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.